Boy Garnage, and I was born and raised on the reservation in Cherokee, about 15 minutes east of us. I'm going to share some stories with you. When I was growing up on the reservation, I had two great uncles who were wonderful storytellers. <coughs> and I would listen to Uncle Dave tell a story and Uncle George tell a story. We go back and forth between them. And I didn't realize that I was learning those stories of my people. And then other elders shared stories with me. And then people from other tribes. And then stories would just happen. And I would be there to remember what took place. I'm going to share a small sampling of some of those stories. Now this first story goes back to a time when the first man and first woman appeared on the earth. And some of you may be thinking, ah, he's talking about Adam and Eve. Now remember, this is a Cherokee story. And that's not what we call these two people. Now we try to keep things very simple. So instead we called them first man and the first woman. Now the first man and the first woman got into a tremendous argument, much like men and women do even today. <laughs> and the first woman said, she'd had enough of the first man. She started walking off as hard as she could go. And the first man said, let her go. I don't know why. Put up there as long as I did. Started saying, well, George shared things with her. George being around her. Maybe I was wrong. But by the time he changed his mind, she'd been walking so hard and so fast, she was a little dog on the distant horizon. And he knew she was so mad, she would walk all night long. But he had to try and catch her. So he started walking. He walked all day. Night fell. He walked all night. And the next morning, as the sun was rising in the east, he looked ahead of him. She was still a tiny little dog. He just kept walking. As the sun rose up in the sky, they looked down on the first man and took pity on him and decided to help him. It would slow the first woman down so the first man could catch up with her and talk to her. So the son called some huckleberries to go up on the path she was walking. She walked past the huckleberries, didn't pay any attention to them. But then the son called some blackberries to go up along the path. She walked past the blackberries, didn't pay any attention to them. And then the son caused a new fruit to go up in the field she was walking through. And she was walking through the field, crushing his food under her feet, not paying any attention to it. The sun had to descent to the fruit. The scent started drifting up until finally it reached her nose, and when it did, she stopped and looked around to see where that wonderful smell was coming from. She looked behind her and saw where she crushed the fruit. And she bent down and picked one up and smelled it. That's where the smell was coming from. Then she took a bite. Oh, it was delicious. And she looked around and saw the field was filled with this new fruit. And she thought, my man would enjoy this. And she started gathering some. And when she gathered all that she could carry, she started back. That was how the first man caught up with the first woman. She was coming back to share food with him. Now today, this fruit is red and is in the shape of a heart because it brought the first man and the first woman back together again. And we know this fruit as a strawberry. <laughs> Do we have any golfers in the audience? Any golfers? Good. Excuse me. Okay. This point is here. Long ago, when man beat on the ground, the sticks howled at the heavens. They called it witchcraft. Now today, it's called Golf. <laughs> 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 well, now, in the old days, the animals had special powers, and the terrapin and the possum had bonded together, and they were working together, and the possum had climbed up a persimmon tree. And he was pulling the persimmon off and drop it down and the terrapin would go over and eat the persimmon and then the possum would pull one off and eat that. Then he'd pull another one off and drop it down to the terrapin. And there was a working together as friends. But then a wolf was coming through the woods and he saw the possum dropping him down to the terrapin and getting one for himself. And the wolf walked over and he straddled the terrapin's shell. And the possum just would pull one off and drop it down. And he happened to glance down and the wolf grabbed uh, the fruit and started eating it. 
Boston pulled one off, started eating it. Then it pulled another percent off, and it threw that down. And the wolf snatched it out of the air. And the terrapin, of course, he's not going to do anything to the wolf. Boston pulled another one off, and started eating, started thinking about what the wolf was doing. Pulled another one off and watched, and sure enough, the wolf moved over and snatched it out of the air, started eating it. Boston pulled one more off himself, and he started looking around. He found a great, great big green persimmon, and he snatched it off, sort of held it behind him, and then he threw it real quick, and the wolf went running over it, snatched it out of the air, and he started choking because it was so big, it was choking his windpipe. And he was gasping and coughing, and finally he choked to death on the green persimmon because it was green. And the terrapin carried a knife in his belt. He went over the wolf and he cut off one of the wolf's ears and he shaped the ear so it was like a spoon. Put a hole through it and put it on the thong around his neck. And it started moving on. And word started spreading about the terrapin carrying the wolf's ear on the thong around his neck. And finally, word reached the wolves. And the wolves started howling and gathering the pack. And the pack came in and when they came together, the wolf had heard the story started telling him about the terrapin collecting the wolf's ear. Well, the terrapin was going to villages, and those times, people would sit a, bottle, a, a bowl of porridge outside the door. And if you're hungry, you could come and eat the porridge. And what the uh, terrapin was doing was using a wolf's ear as a spoon, and getting up the porridge, and moving on so everybody saw the wolf's ear around his neck. And the wolves started calling up all the other wolves and they told them what had happened. And they started going out to find the terrapin. They were howling and growling, going to the forest. And the terrapin heard the wolves. And word had spread about what the wolves were going to do to him. And he started running for his life through the forest. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew the wolves were gathering. He didn't know where he could go to hide. And he kept running as fast as he could. And finally, he came out of the woods and he was on the edge of a large cliff and there was a river far below. And he looked around and he could hear the wolves coming through the forest and they picked up a scent. And he knew at this a very short time they'd be on top of him and they'd tear him to pieces. And finally they burst out of the woods and the cherubim had a choice of waiting for the wolves to get him and tear him apart or to try and jump off the cliff. But he elected to jump off the cliff. And it was so high that when he hit the water, he Chill, broken, down in pieces. And he sank underneath the waters. But he had such powerful medicine that he called all the pieces of the shell together and put them back on his back. And when he climbed, uh, climbed out of the water, his shell was cracked as you see it today. And that's why it's cracked, because the terrible leaped off the cliff to escape the wolves. <laughs> Now, before we lost the gift of being able to talk to the animals, the hummingbird saw this beautiful woman in the chair, and he started courting her. And he was about to ask her to marry him when the crane also saw her. The crane was long-legged, ungainly, not exactly the prettiest bird in the forest. And the Cherokee woman looked at the crane and sort of, ooh, and then the hummingbird, ooh. And the crane started coming in and wanted to quarter too. And finally she said, all right, you two have a race. Whoever wins the race, I will marry. And of course she was thinking the hummingbird as fast as he was was going to win. So they agreed they'd start the race the next morning. So he lined up and the beautiful woman said, go. And the hummingbird was off like a shot. In just a few seconds he was out of sight. And the crane started flapping his wings and he finally got airborne and he started flying. Well, the hummingbird stopped for lunch. Then he started flying again. When it got dark, he ate supper. He went up into a tree to spend the night. But what he didn't know was Crane could fly all night. And during the night, Crane was flying. And he passed where the hummingbird was spending the night. And the hummingbird woke up the next morning and had breakfast and he started out. He was thinking, the Crane is so far behind me. And about lunchtime, he passed the crane. He was in the stream, spearing fish for his lunch. 
and the hummingbird couldn't believe the crane had gotten ahead of him. So he's flying even harder, and that night he had supper and he stopped. The crane just kept flying all night. And the next day, it was late afternoon before the hummingbird caught up to the crane, and he couldn't believe the crane had gotten ahead of him again. And he was flapping even harder. He spent the night, the crane flew all night. And the next morning, it came to the finish line. And it was noon before the hummingbird showed up. And a beautiful Cherokee woman, when she realized the crane had won the race, decided she wouldn't marry either one. And that's the story of the race between the crane and the hummingbird. <laughs> Our stories are not always light, but they explain why certain things are done. This is not a very nice story. There was a Cherokee hunter who had gone into the forest, he left his wife and children in the cabin, and he's going to the forest, he was looking for food. Well, his children were playing outside the cabin, and suddenly the mother heard the children scream. And she was running out, and they were pointing at a big rattlesnake that was there by the edge of the yard. And she picked up a big stick and went out and killed the rattlesnake, and picked him up on the stick, threw him into the forest. Well, the hunter was traveling far away from the forest, and then he started hearing crying and waiting in the forest ahead of him. And he kept going until finally he came to this large clearing in the forest, and there were rattlesnakes of all kinds all around the clearing. They were crying and waiting. And the hunter went over to a rattlesnake and asked him, what is wrong? And he said, your wife has killed our chief, the yellow rattlesnake. We are mourning his loss. And when we finish mourning, we will seek revenge. We will kill your wife and children. And the hunter said, but, but they didn't mean to do it. They didn't mean to do it. The rattlesnake said, they killed our chief, and they must pay the hunter said, no, take me instead, take me. And he said, no, you were here in the forest with us. You were not involved. It was your wife and your children. And the hunter kept pleading with him, please take my life, bear them. And the rattlesnake said, we will have counsel and decide. So all the rattlesnakes came together in the middle of the clearing. And the hunter waited for a while, and then finally the rattlesnake came back. He said, we will make you this offer. Give us your children, and your wife will live. Give us your wife, she will live, and your children will die. And the hunter said, there must be another choice. The house thing said, that's the choice we will give, who we will kill, we will kill them all. The hunter said, if I give you my wife, my children will live. Ralph said, yes. The hunter said, and I will give you my wife. And Ralph said, the black rattlesnake will go with you and he will do this deed. They started off through the forest, the black rattlesnake was traveling with him. And they traveled for a long time and then finally the hunter said, from the top of the ridge, you can see my cabin on the other side, what do you want me to do? And the rattlesnake told him, Tell your woman to bring, come out and get a fresh gourd of spring water. Keep your children inside and I will tell you when we are done. So the hunter got up to the top of the ridge and he called out. The children were playing in the valley below and they saw him and they started waving to him. The hunter, with a heavy heart, was waving back. And he called out to the mother and went running back to the cabin to let them all know Dad was coming home. He went down off the ridge and got to the valley below. And the children came running across the valley floor to meet him. He picked them up and hugged them, and his wife was standing in the door, wiping her hands. He said, come in, I've got food on the table. Come in and eat, you must be tired. As he got to the door, he reached out and he hugged her. And he held her next to a long time, and she played through, slapped him on the shoulder. He said, come in and eat, I've got food on the table. And he went in and sat down at the table, and there was food on the table. And she said, there, there's food. You should not eat it, what is wrong? He said, I would like a gourd of fresh spring water. And she said, the gourd is fresh on the table. And again he repeated, 
or like a gourd for spring water. And then my story, and she picked up another gourd and went outside the cabin. His children were sitting on either side of him. All of a sudden, he heard his wife scream, and the children jumped up, and he grabbed the children to him and hugged them. He said, no, no, let's go. We need to help Mom. He said, no, stay here, stay here. And then their screams died away. And he heard the black rattlesnake say, now we are satisfied. But do not hurt our people again, or we will come back and seek revenge on your people. Today, if you ask an elder, will they harm a rattlesnake in the forest? They will tell you no. They will go around or move him out of the path. But they won't harm him, because they all know the story of rattlesnake's revenge.